the second panel discussion is leveraging gen ai to manage cyber risks the interesting thing about this session is that it's going to be an open house discussion let us have on stage the panel of speakers for this session Mishra Laka Verma, Director, Customer Success, BFSI, Microsoft. Sri Atish Mandelicha, Founder, Strack. And our moderator for this session is Sri Sundareswar K, Partner and Leader, Cybersecurity, PwC India. May I now request Sri Sundarashwar to initiate the discussion. Over to you, sir. Can we give it a minute? Request you all to please, please be seated. I think you can start, sir. Start? Okay, thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon to all of you. Hope the lunch was, uh, was good. Um, so we have about 30, 35 minutes of uh, a discussion on a topic which is uh, most sought after these days, either because we understand it very well or we don't understand it well, either which ways, which is around generative AI. But before we jump into the topic, may I request my uh, co-panelists to take uh, a minute and introduce themselves, please. Hi guys, I'm Atish. I'm the founder and CEO of Strack. Uh, Strack is a SaaS DLP and an endpoint DLP with a data discovery focus, uh, classification, redaction of sensitive data across all communication channels, including email, Office 65, OneDrive, Windows, endpoints, laptops, uh, and uh, SaaS. We have over like 50 SaaS apps integrations and also all the endpoints on the mobile devices. Prior to this, I spent over 11 years on Amazon in payments in the US, uh, building their widgets, the APIs, and security. Uh, most recently, built their payment secure zone on AWS, where we store and manage all the credit cards, the bank accounts, and connection with payment partners. Happy to be here and discuss about generative AI, as we have a lot of machine learning and AI experience, and how that can translate into the reality. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Shalaka. Uh, I take care of uh, customer success for Microsoft, for BFSI specifically. Uh, I cut across entire Microsoft technology stack and happy to be here to engage on this interesting dialogue. Thank you to both of you. Um, uh, I'm a partner with PwC. I so I'm a partner with PwC. I uh, lead the cyber business for PwC in India. And uh, it's very interesting. You have two product uh, people and one consultant on stage who are going to talk to all the practitioners. Uh, so uh, just bear with us for the next uh, 30, 35 minutes. Uh, and uh, I think with that, we'll perhaps get started. You know, I'd like to kind of set the context. Um, you know, I think generative AI, like I said, is, is a buzzword uh, as we speak today. But we put some data around this buzz to really understand uh, what it is. And I take you back to the digital, in, uh, digital trust insight survey that we did as PwC about a couple of months ago that we launched. Um, and what we heard is that uh, out of about 150 respondents from India, which is you know the likes of all of you, 75% um, of them came back and said that uh, they would want to use generative AI for security. Uh, and interestingly, 90% of them came back and said they do feel a little vulnerable uh, because generative AI can also uh, be used by attackers. Uh, so, you know, that's really what it is. And when any new, um, you know, technology comes into the market, the bad guys embrace it faster than the good guys, right? And that's the situation that we are in. And once the bad guys embrace it, the good guys and the defenders, which is all of us, try to put a framework together, then the regulation comes, 
right? That's, that's really how it happens. But in the case of generative AI, we are seeing regulation come faster than what we are anticipating uh, it to be, at least in the global markets and hopefully uh, in India as well. So with that context, uh, I just want to start with something very basic uh, to with, with both of you and Shalaka maybe uh, first to you. Look, we've heard of terms predictive AI, generative AI, machine learning and so on and so forth. Uh, how do you kind of differentiate between all of these or are these just uh, uh, buzzwords that are there which all, which kind of mean the same? No, I mean, so uh, I, I think we have evolved a lot in terms of AI itself. Um, artificial AI intelligence, I think, as a term started out quite a few decades back. And we have grown from there in terms of how do you get to the artificial intelligence? And sometimes we were starting with the rule-based models. Then we looked at machine learning. Within machine learning, we had a branch of deep learning, neural networks. Uh, and then eventually, uh, on the parallel fence, I think the large language models or NLPs were developing. Um, and all of this progress continues to sort of happen, right? Uh, what changed, I think, in last one year was the consumability of the AI itself uh, because OpenAI sort of went and did uh, this experimentation, as they call it now, in terms of opening up a very easy to use interface to the LLM model for larger uh, B2C consumer base. Um, neither do, uh, did they anticipate the kind of uptake that would happen. Uh, and neither did the enterprises. But now that we are here and now, uh, I think the expectation is already set in terms of how would we like to interact with machines moving forward. That does not take away the rest of the core work that has to happen on AI though, right? Which is really about the mathematical model, doing the data churning and so on and so forth. That has to continue. Uh, it's just that I think we will see more and more consumption of those insights into a natural language interface, and that's really the revolution of Gen AI is all about. Sure. Do you want to add in? <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm an engineer of profession, so uh, generative AI came along, uh, like when Sam Altman, founder of OpenAI, uh, is, is, a, is a YC guy, and we are also backed by Y Combinator. Uh, the interesting thing about generative AI is like, it just predicts the next literal word. So th assuming that that particular technology is going to transform the entire human life is uh, silly in a way because like all these things happening and we're saying the next word that you're going to generate is not going to be the, the most consequential thing of our generation. And I think Jeff Bezos in his podcast literally last, last week, uh, he said that um, the LLM thing is more of a discovery. Like telescope was an invention but discovering, like looking at the Mars was a discovery. Similarly, generative AI is a discovery. We don't really know what we're going to do with it exactly. The only thing which is useful right now, which I think Microsoft, OpenAI, AWS Bedrock, uh, Llama, Meta, like all these open, the open source models over here, what is going to be very interesting is more in your day-to-day, -day, like the menial task or the easy tasks, that will be resolved. I think that's, that's the easy part to be done. The human involvement, especially for software developers, the big useful impact right now of LLMs or generative AI for software developers is I think not for any other else. The reason is because uh, there's so much code being published in the last 30, 40 years. It's already out on the internet. It can actually predict the next literal word, the next little code. So it becomes useful for software developers a lot. And hence, now coming to security, it helps security engineers a lot from a security operations point of view. A good example is you have these uh, logs, logs of seam tools going to Splunk, maybe using Splunk, or you just have audit logs, audit logs going through this thing. Now you want to detect what is suspicious and not suspicious. So far, machine learning models were so-so. LLMs take it to a next level because now the patterns that are emerging is easier, way easier because the, the, it's a finite data set problem. It's not an infinite data set problem. Very niche problems are actually very well suited for this LLMs and generative AI. And I think we're just beginning to see how and more use cases. But so far, it's just like, you have to understand that it's just predicting next word. So once you understand like that, that is the only aha moment, 
only certain things can be done really well. Otherwise, er everything else is a hallucination in a way for most use cases as a merit. Sure, I think that's, uh, uh, that's a good one, Atish. I'll just stay with you. You spoke about use cases, so I'll kind of latch on to that now. Um, can you tell us one solid use case in cybersecurity from a defense standpoint, right? Where uh, generative AI could perhaps uh, transform the way one is looking at it, either by reducing time, increasing possibility, probability, reducing risk, whatever it is. Yeah, across industries. Yeah. Across industries? Any uh, industry, I would say. Yeah, yeah, across industries, copywriting is the major use case. There's no other use case which is like the killer use for generative AI because in order to write an essay, in order to write a blog post, in order to write this thing, it is easier if you can start with, it is easier to get started. The harder part is quality. And that's where generative AI is missing because it doesn't have a brain on its own. The brain is already of the large corpus of text. So the insights part is actually missing. So the, the, I would still not consider that is a killer use case. The killer use case essentially is the summarization of like the use case, the example that was shown earlier. I have an incident report going, incident going on. The ticket is long ticket. As simple as I would say WhatsApp chat messages. Like you, we all are in the WhatsApp group messages and there's a long thread going on between different members you really want like somebody to summarize this thing. Those summarization is the single solid use case of generative AI, which I think in security, for example, uh, all the incident response uh, team members, essentially, that is a use case where it can really summarize well in a way, and it is l lossless in a way, so it is not so lossy also. So summarization is about, I would say, is the one solid use case if you have to pick one thing. Sure, Shalaka? in the context, uh, and let's just step back uh, a bit, right? Um, uh, especially in the security. Uh, what Shalaka, your mic is not working. Okay. So, uh, especially in the context of security, I think we saw, we see three kind of scenarios where we are getting sort of outpaced, right? One is the scale, uh, the second one is the speed, and the third one is the sophistication. That's how broadly I would sort of uh, segment where the security risks are. Uh, the speed, like for example, if you were to clearly look at what Microsoft is seeing on the Azure platform, I think we have gone from about 500 plus password attacks per second to about 5,000 plus in last two to three years. So that's how the intensity of the attack is, is sort of increasing. Uh, if you look at the scale on the platform itself, on the Azure platform itself, today we look at about 65 trillion signals every day across a million customer base. So most of these attacks which happen are already machine-led, right? It's not really possible for a human scale to get there. Uh, and then the sophistication of these attacks is improving every day. So the bet is really about figuring out the technologies which can sort of help us tackle all three. And that's the approach I think we are trying to take. Now the core offering that you would have already heard about in the Ignite, uh, et cetera, is the security co-pilot. But security co-pilot is not one product. It's like different products sitting into your different security endpoint solutions, which will eventually work together to get to an outcome or an insight. I will give you not use case, but the, the end outcomes that we are trying to drive. And I think there was a, a conversation maybe a few minutes back on, you know, how do we need to pivot on outcomes rather than the capability itself, right? Now, the first North Star for co-pilots is really figuring out can we outspace, uh, can we outpace our adversaries, right? That's really the North Star. Now followed by that is the biggest gap that we see in the industry right now in terms of the tech talent, right? We have about three million position open in the security across the globe. Uh, and we are really struggling to get the right kind of uh, people in because we seem to get more and more focused and specialized in terms of the demands. Uh, so can we sort of bridge that? So are we able to bridge the talent gap and are we able to enhance the expertise in the team? That's the second outcome that we are looking at. Third one is, because we are having so many signals, our ability to sort of 
get human fatigue in is very high. So can we, machines are not really getting fatigued or tired. Uh, and they are going to look at every problem with the same kind of rigor and consistency. So really looking at, are we able to reduce my security risk by taking down the human intervened error or oversight is probably the third outcome that we are trying to look at. The fourth one is about figuring out the complexity. Can, uh, are we able to simplify the complexity by looking at different point solutions and figuring out is there a way for us to reduce say a false positive or false negatives that can sort of help us address the problems better. And then the last one, but not the least one, is if the incident occurs, are we able to improve our response in terms of both speed and quality, right? So those are really the outcomes with which the security co-pilot is sort of taking this leap of faith on product innovation. Uh, and we are really keen to sort of, you know, work with all of you to understand whether, wh what does it mean to define these kind of outcomes? How do you define ROI on these outcomes? And then work towards those success criteria together. That's really going to be my call, folks. Uh, thanks, uh, Shalaka. Is this working? It's on? Okay. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll probably take a segue from there. You spoke about ROI. Um, you know, as bankers in this room, we've got to justify every investment that one is making in technology and more importantly in, in security. Uh, and there are tough questions that one needs to answer. Um, and if you've been breached, then there are questions that are tougher. In this whole context, you know, this whole generative AI space has come about where every technology claims that they have, uh, they're powered by Gen AI. I'm not going to debate whether it is or it is not. Let's assume that it is. Um, Atish, my question to you is in that context, if you had to sit down in front of a management and justify the return on investment, right? Uh, how would you go about telling that story? Uh, great question. I don't think any company or any bank, for the matter, is buying a generative AI solution. I think they're buying a solution to a problem. So for example, like our customers, like we sell data discovery, data loss prevention, right? They're not talking about give me a generative AI powered DLP solution. What they're saying is that I have all this unstructured text documents over all these SaaS apps, endpoints, MacBooks, Windows, Windows file servers, on-prem on and everything. Can you scan for it? I think that's the real problem. What generative AI has helped vendors across the space, whether it's phishing attacks for like proof points of the world, or splunks of the world from the seam integration, or just like uh, any kind of logging, anything of that sort, they have all been machine learning powered. They all were using like latest and the greatest AI models also. Generative AI, for the most part, is a buzzword for them, meaning in a year's time, other than Microsoft and Google, nobody has changed the roadmap night to just make this thing. And Google had to do it because they had an existential threat for, from the search point of view. But other than that, all these companies, they're they are taking in these models and just making it better with these large language models. But again, they know that this is going to be perfect. So that's the reason why they have their own teams to make sure that they, the false positive rates are low, hallucination is low, they have all the other things. So just to come back to your question about when you present to a board or anything, or to even a management team or CISO, CISO team who are the buyers over here, they're actually trying to say, what is the efficacy of your actual product? Meaning, how does it work better? Now, we may say the word <laughs> generative AI in a way, but really that doesn't help. Where generative AI actually is useful is where certain kind of problems, for example, um, cer certain kind of text which was not even understandable, like for example, machine uh, language support, like you didn't have uh, Malayalam support, you didn't have other support. Now, interestingly, because of the large language models and they're trained on so many different languages around this thing, that has become easier. So the machine learning model, like English, like Hindi being normal thing, is fine. But like specific regional languages, depending on how you're presenting your identity document, or maybe your handwritten documents of that sort, those have become like easier. So it's become more like a feature that you have added quicker. I would say the, so the roadmap has accelerated, but again, the same buyer, 
the same vendor is actually trying to just sell more on the features rather than saying that is I'm generative AI. Sure. Okay. No, that's uh, that's interesting. Um, add a couple yeah, of please. points here, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, see the way I see this um, selling motion of generative AI. I mean, it's tough, honestly. Uh, we see lot and lot of uptake at POC and MVP stage, um, and very few conversion to the large scale production. Um, and that has to do with a couple of things uh, in my view, right? One is what I called out. Most of the outcomes that we are trying to define with generative AI are very qualitative outputs in that sense, like increase the quality of your workforce, increase the expertise, reduce the response time and the quality of the response itself, and so on and so forth. So we are figuring out the ways to put a dollar value around it. And we are not so successful, I would say, that is the first port of call. And again, I'm, I'm really going to call out uh, leaders in this room to say, hey, sit with us, work with us. We really want to figure out what makes it valuable for you uh, as an enterprise so that we are able to bring this technology forward in the way that it matters, right? So that's first call out. The second one where I see uh, us getting challenged more frequently is the supportability of the AI. Uh, because the problem is that uh, the the models are so large today in terms of the, the way they are working and functioning. Most of the organizations will not be able to take a call to say, I'm going to run my own model. So it basically means that eventually you are going to make that open AI calls uh, and are really going to rely on the response that comes. Uh, and get to a stage where you are probably going to apply, say, fine tuning and prompt engineering on top to say here is what I am comfortable with in terms of my risk appetite versus the concern versus my ability to trust an outcome and so on and so forth. And the things in the LLM models may change because the models are learning externally, right? Uh, and so the, to manage how am I going to sort of keep interacting and still have an outcome that is defined and compliant for my organization, I think that is a gray area at this point. Uh, and we are sort of working with customers to figure out how to get this streamlined. Uh, the third one I see is the agility part because it is an over, ever evolving space. So the compliance guidelines, the regulatory policy, the policy framework itself, all is changing. Uh, and hence the concern is if I adopt something today, am I going to stay married? Uh, and will I have the ability to respond to the change when it occurs and it's going to be costly for me or not, right? So I think. That is also a concern that I hear multiple times from uh, from people like but the people in this room. Um, and the last one I would call out is the fact of anticipating the risk. Right? I, I think we are not doing a good job of to, of it. We are saying a lot of these things because we always feel that the threat of machine learning when it is going to outsmart all of us collectively in the domain, in the professional field, is probably far ahead. Uh, and hence, we have the luxury and liberty to get everything right before we adopt. Uh, and I think we are sort of not weighing in enough or creating enough uh, awareness about the threat, how imminent it is, and how far near it is uh, to really push through the adoption. No, very well, very well articulated, yeah. uh, Shalaka. Um, you know, I, I want to ask you uh, about a question that came to us about four and a half months ago uh, in a room uh, full of you know, stakeholders who are important for the organization uh, who wanted to know whether they should open up access to, say, a chat GPT of sorts. And at that point in time, um, we were... Uh, we were not sure ourselves. So we said, let's do a show of hands. And the show of hands was the room was divided. So um, we, we, I may have found some answers to that question. Um, but I want to know your view and your view. What, what, what would your advice be to bankers? Oh, yeah, 100%. This is right in my alley. So uh, we are a two-year-old startup. And since Chad GPT it was started in last November, <coughs> our actual growth of, from the customers, like nobody knows us, like everybody knows Microsoft, right? I mean, nobody knows Stack. We are a young startup, like 
but people are finding us on the internet, the same Google search, the same Microsoft Bing, and trying to reach out to ask the question, my company, and these are banks, large enterprises across the US, across Europe, even in India and Asia, like, I want to use ChatGPT, but my CISO, my CIO, just my large leadership is not allowing me to use it for all the reasons what you're saying, like they need approval, access to like do, do this thing. And the, pri what, and the primary concern was, they're like, we are not sure if some employee will share the PI data of company, maybe the company's financial statements uh, on ChatGPT or maybe Googlebot or anything of that sort. How do we prevent it? Like, and the use cases ra range depending on how deep you are. Like somebody were concerned about code. My code, my company code was being shared on ChatGPT because ChatGPT is really good at code, like analyzing code and generating code. I don't want the code to be shared with ChatGPT. So how do we actually solve for this thing? And that's where our uh, ChatGPT DLP solution, with the, what we do essentially is to resolve these concerns. And the way how we do it is before we actually the, when the user types in a prompt, and prompt contains any kind of sensor data, whether it's customer PI, healthcare data, patient data, financial data, company code, anything of that sort, we'll scan for that in near real time, essentially, and we'll just block it. Either we'll block it or redact it or mask it, essentially, so it doesn't hit the open AI's like LLM model or any other LLM model. Not only that, we go deeper into this thing on the backend servers. Let's say you're a developer. Developer is using uh, open AI's APIs over here, and again, OpenAI API, the, the biggest risk why all the businesses are rightfully worried is because it is a large neural network. So neural network will actually take in this data and may use it for future. So there may be a data leak that may happen through LLM models, which is a valid security risk. So they want to prevent this thing. So on the API side of things, on the cloud security, initially I think there was a topic about cloud security. This is a big thing about uh, cloud security from not only from what is happening in generally for the last 10 years on AWS and Azure, but more so on generative AI side of cloud security of how do I prevent data to not be leaked to the LLM models. And that's where like we actually prevent it by blocking it, redacting and masking it, so that now LLMs don't even know about sensor data. They actually are just tokens for them. They are like, un, like anonymized data, data minimization is essentially, which is part of DPDP compliance or GDPR or PCR, like all the compliance frameworks, which essentially now we have hidden the real customer data from being shared with the, uh, this thing. So uh, just circling back to your original question, the valid is concerned, uh, but I think we have solutions out there to actually s resolve the concerns of all the bankers or whoever is dealing with more sensitive data of how should we not send this to LLM models because that is a valid concern. Add something? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll take it as you know a question of. I don't think this is a question of whether we should open ourselves to ChatGPT or not. It's a question of how and when um, we will end up doing it any which way, right? So that's first call. Uh, the second one is the user. The end user expectation will force us to do that. Is how I see it because banking we may take a call to sort of just delay it a bit. But the user habits are anyway getting formed what, by what they are seeing in the retail space or B2C space, right? It's like, can we debate on whether the mail access should be there on mobile or laptop? Not, right? It, it's not a debate anymore because that expectation is already set with the user. So I think some of that will already happen. Uh, and hence, it's pertinent for us to probably just stay ahead of this and figure out what is the best way for us to open up our doors, right? Uh, and I will put this in the context of responsible AI framework, uh, essentially. Uh, and I believe that it, it, it helps to think about responsible AI in more structured, pillared way. I'll just call out how, how Microsoft thinks about it, but I think there is an opportunity for every industry or every organization to define how are they going to adopt AI in general. Uh, now, what we do at Microsoft is we have sort of distri distributed this responsible AI across six pillars. I'll call out them. One is fairness. Fairness is really about figuring out if the AI is going to behave the way it should behave for an unintended recipient, right? The second one is inclusivity. Does it take into account all the inclusive kind of people and uh, the use cases that it's going to interact with? 
The third one is the privacy and uh, security, which is really about saying, hey, my data, do I have full control on my data, whether it's PII, customer data, organization data, and so on and so forth. Do I have full control over it? And does it, is it getting used only for the purpose that I'm allowing it to be getting used? This, the fourth one is really the reliability, right? Am I getting a response that is fair, inclusive, but at the same time reliable? Because whether we like it or not, eventually people who are using this information will start to trust it. We are saying there is always human in the loop. You have to have an oversight and so on and so forth. But there is going to be a motion of saying, okay, eventually we will end up trusting it. And hence, it needs to be reliable and it needs to improve on the quality and accuracy as it move forward. Right? And the last one really is about accountability. I think Microsoft is doing a fair job of calling out how do we share the accountability of any consumption that you do on across open AI technologies, both in the legal framework as well as in terms of the qualitative uh, contribution that we will do with our customers. But I think overall, setting up organizations for AI adoption is a, is a good way of structuring this conversation, I feel. Uh, and I, what you called out, right? In this space, we are seeing the regulatory body sort of taking a lead position uh, very quickly because I think it's touching everything and every individual at this point. Um, while we are, sorry about that. So while we are taking that positioning, uh, I think it's always sort of, I'm a technologist, right? So I feel that what happens is the regulatory bodies always do a catch up game. So there is a need for all of us to be self-governing and self-regulatory in this space because the compliance will always do a catch-up game and the damage in the open AI is really hard to sort of do a catch-up and eventually eliminate, right? So we need to figure out how do we enforce self-governance and how do we sort of keep that balance in at an organization level as well as at an industry level. Sure, thanks, thanks so much. Um, I believe the format allows us to take one audience question, if I may. Um, while you, yeah, sure. Uh, and machine learning, all these will work on a lot of data. So is there any work going on whereby, say for example, instead of the data being processed at the, at each of the uh, organization side, since a lot of this is a PI data, why not it is processed at the customer side. So for example, just to give an example, suppose if uh, always uh, you will analyze based on AI and you will tell me that you are eligible for this, this offer, correct? Every bank will tell me that. So instead of that, I know myself about my data, correct? That I have a particular repayment history or I have a particular credit history or something. And the data resides me, that means at my side, and the company just tells me, so there is no exchange of data, but there is a kind of a trust between both the entities. And when I say that, okay, look, this is what is the outcome, and I get that particular benefit. So that will save hassle for both the sides, because the concerns what you mentioned that we don't give permission to use, let us say, chat, GPT, and all that, that is because of a lot of data exchange fear is there. Instead of the data, only algorithm is exchanged, mm -hmm. and there is a kind of a trust between both the entities that will save hassle of this kind of. So I don't know whether since Microsoft and the startup is there, whether any such work is going on whereby instead of data being processed in AI or ML, only algorithms are exchanged and processed, and the data resides with the owner. And, and by algorithms being transferred, are you saying these large language models to be deployed in your environment kind of thing? Or are you talking yeah, about? Means it is spread, you know, now computing power also. A lot of, let us say for example, my device. So suppose my device, can it be built that only my data is processed there? So algorithm right. is received no, at my yeah, side. You know, I, yeah. I get it, it's yes. Yes, the short answer is yes. There's a l huge amount of R&D happening, so for example, uh, Llama 2, which is the Meta's uh, LLM model essentially over here, uh, you can actually deploy that on a phone. And they, the, the, the basic thing about LLMs is the reason why there's a shortage of GPUs, and that's the reason why NVIDIA stock is going up on the rise, is because they're the king of making GPUs, and 
you need a lot of processing to make to even make anything reasonable over here. That's the reason why every all large companies, a big tech play over here with Amazon, Google, Microsoft, all having the front uh, horse race over here, because the the processing power is very high. However, having said that thing, there are like sh like very special purpose LLMs are coming up essentially, which can be deployed on like now like starting with phone. Phone is the biggest the biggest use case. And that's the reason why Apple is supposed to be like, there is a, there is this again, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's real news or not, but there's a lot of talk about in the iPhones itself, Apple is going to roll out its own LLM essentially, which will do a lot of what you're saying essentially. Like that part is, will happen. If it's not happening in 2024, maybe in like three, four years, it will be mainstream essentially by the time. Uh, having said all of this thing, at the end of the day, the day the question is how, as as devices get powerful, LLMs get powerful. Still, if the data is at the at the peri at the perimeter itself, great. But the thing is, we still need that insight about what is happening, from like from a thing from a data loss prevention, data leak prevention about like some employee is trying to share some data. You still need those alerts and notification and, and everything being sent to your home server because your security and IT teams need to get that in information. So that problem still doesn't go away. But the problem, if at all, can go away is can we run the machine learning algorithms on the client side itself? Now that's, I would say it's a more of a TBD than right now. I will sort of take this question in two parts, right? One is the B2C use cases, and the other one is B2B. In B2C, I think overall the industry is calling out eventually like a blue sky vision thinking, eventually every individual will have their own digital assistant. I think a lot of startups are there, fundings are happening, VCs are sort of going crazy over this kind of model where you are saying, okay, I will have my own assistant and I really am not going to deal with anything. Uh, anyone is going to contact me via their digital assistant, like a bank is calling me via digital assistant, I am rather going to ask my digital assistant to sort of interact and close, right? So that pull is there, but we are not ready. It will take a lot of time to get there. From the B2B perspective, what happens is it is not really about an individual. It is about an organization's data. So while an individual may share or may not share that information outside, you as an enterprise is responsible for ensuring that you have all the audit trail, compliance trails to prove that the data has not left the boundary and so on and so forth, right? So you need all of this governance to be established. I think Microsoft does a fair job of putting the Azure Open AI in the context of your identity, your security, ensuring that the data doesn't go out, et cetera. At the same time, giving you the right kind of audit trails and controls to prove it if required. Uh, because the accountability and the liability is there, right? In, in terms of what you have to uh, show and not show. So I think the, there are two ways of uh, addressing this problem. One is really look at the governance mechanism. The second one is also look at how are you going to test the solutions of generative AI into your setup? How, do, how are you going to be confident to say, yes, whatever we are saying is not really happening, right? So, so I think those are the two things that I'll call out here. Great. Thanks, uh, Shalaka. I think we are, uh, we are done with uh, uh, from a timing standpoint. I just probably conclude by saying that uh, I think what we heard today is that generative AI is here to stay. The benefits uh, will outweigh the risks, um, and organizations will adopt them, and so will attackers. So, uh, so we are in business, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> having said that, you know, if machines do everything, what will humans do? Uh, so we also need to go back and reskill ourselves a little bit to find out what, uh, how we can really contribute back uh, to the organization. Thank you very much. Uh, and I do hope we were able to add some value to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the wonderful deliberations.